Fighting is our absolute last resort. Our job is to protect, <coughs> protect, protect, protect. And nothing can protect anything better than the truth. Nothing. And when we get up and we have something here where we can take a spiritual and a cultural and a written book, college education knowledge, and throw that all into one, whoo! Now there's a tool. There's a tool. So with much, much gratitude, with much gratitude, I, you all know my good friend Winona and my newest good friend, Miss Paula Maccabee. We'll walk you guys through the evening, and I thank you all for coming here. Really, really, I do. I, I, it means the world to me. This is totally out of my realm. Totally out of my realm. Believe it or not, I would much rather be in, in the back of the room and go Winona. <laughs> go, well, I'm back here with my pipe. I got you. Girl. I got you. But, you know, but she knows, and we all know that any given time, even you, if somebody's mean to you, we'll be there and say, mm, no, not today. Not today, no more. So that's the thing that I really want to set the stage with that, is what can we do together to protect the land? Not worry about fighting parliament, not worry about fighting Enbridge and fighting corporations, but what can we do to protect the land? Because if we focus on them, we will lose focus on this. So we need to focus on this, and they can't touch that. If we let them get into that zone, we're going to break our concentration. We need to stay focused on the land and our resources and letting them know. You know, I picture that movie, this is and then this is it, because I like to do roundabout stuff. I always picture at times like this, I don't remember which movie it is, but it's when I have a five and a three year old. So a lot of my life is done in metaphoric speaking of movies. Yo Gabba Gabba, all that kind of stuff. But there's a movie where the animals just finally fight back. The birds are flying through the sky, dropping bombs, the pine cones, and this and that, the people. The squirrels are running and popping tires and pulling brake lines on vehicles. I'm your man. You guys want to do that? I'll call in the army. Okay? Love you all. Enjoy the evening, and let's have some fun. He's a pro. I'm a lawyer. My realm is in front of the computer, and I need one of these. A uh, little background. Um, these are the people who've been here for thousands of years. I'm the first generation. I'm a newcomer. And my religion, I'm Jewish, so if you want to ask questions, I won't be upset, because that's part of my religion. But our religion, what we're put on earth to do is to repair the world. And this is um, my, I mean, I like to fight. But if, I think the main thing is that we're fighting with the truth. We're not fighting with violence. We're not fighting with rage. We're fighting with facts. We're fighting with science. We're fighting with the truth. And I am the, as this isn't on yet. Do you know how to do that? Come on. I'm only a freshman. There it is. There it is. You did it. And can people can people see that? No. Do we need to turn the lights down? Oh. Turn the lights down low, okay? All right. Um, can we have a little light so you can so I can see? No, a little, a little more light, guys. They're, they're perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, my name is Paula McAfee, and I'm the advocacy director and uh, lawyer working with Water Legacy. And Water Legacy is a small nonprofit grassroots that was formed to protect the water in Minnesota and the communities, both animal and human beings, who rely on having fresh, clean water. And I've sort of tentatively talked about, oh dear, I can't even see the change the slides. That's terrible. There we go. Um, Do you, yeah. you know, I would love a slide helper who could see. That would be so wonderful. Um, 
We're talking about polymet today because polymet is a place where we can see how it's all connected. That the only way to protect the water is by honoring the earth. And what is polymet? Polymet is as a copper nickel sulfide mine. Now, sometimes you, if you went to any of the hearings, they say it's not a sulfide mine, it's a copper nickel mine. There's the proof it's a sulfide mine because the total amount of sulfur content in what they're going to dig up is a little bit over 1%. Total amount of copper nickel is about 0.86%. So there's more sulfur than there is copper and nickel, so you can call it a sulfide mine. And what that also means is that 99% of what they're going to be digging and blasting out of the ground is going to be waste. And that waste is going to be there forever. And that's, oh, these numbers are if the mining is only for 20 years. And it might go even longer than that. But the minimum is 308 million tons of waste rock and 226 million tons of tailings waste. Next slide. And this is a, just a sense of where this is located. Um, the point that Michael made before is that this is not the first mine. There are cumulative impacts. And here's that string of mines, which as we know, it's the Iron Range. And that little blue arrow on top is where they're proposing to put the polymet mine. Now, this other arrow here is for the Fond du Lac Reservation. Because one of the things that is the most troubling to me about this project is initially the copper mines were proposed closer to the boundary waters. And a lot of people got motivated and said, oh, we can't have mines near the boundary waters. And there are at least some people who said, this is going to be the sacrifice zone. OK. Um, there's the St. Louis River, most important estuary for Lake Superior fish. Tribal people rely on not only the Fond du Lac Reservation, Grand Portage Reservation, anyone who relies on fish, this is an absolutely critical place. But the initial concept was, this is the sacrifice zone. This is the place where it's easier to put the mine than up by the boundary waters. And I want to see nonsense, nonsense. This is an area where there's a pristine public land that this is being located on. And all the pollution is going to come down the St. Louis River. It's not only going to affect the tribal people, it's going to affect anybody who wants to fish or, wa or gather wild rice through that area. So I guess the first message is, this is not a good place to put a sulfide mine. There isn't a good place. And asking somebody to be a sacrificial zone for a foreign co corporation very bad idea. Next slide. Paula? Yes. Um, could you turn on the mic? I think it's on. No. Ah, I sound really loud to myself, but not to anybody else. <laughs> so right. Good All right. Cool. There you go. Now do I have to talk really quietly so I don't blast you? <laughs> All right. All right. So where is it? Where is this mine supposed to be located? Lake Superior Basin. It's important because these are internationally important waters, not just nationally. Um, the polymet mine is proposed to be located on superior national forest land. What that means, one, is if you're a member of the European community, this is our United States government public land. It is supposed to be used for a public purpose, not a private purpose. And we also have to be aware that this is land ceded to the United States government by the Anishinaabe tribes. That means we have signed treaties, and there is a legal obligation to protect rights to hunt, fish, and gather. And what that means is our government agencies, whether it is the US Forest Service, who um, manages that forest, or the Environmental Protection Agency, they have fiduciary responsibilities, trust responsibilities, to make sure that those lands can still be used to hunt, fish, and gather. Clearly, the polymet mine would interfere with the ability to exercise those legitimate rights. And also, as I was saying, St. Louis River, critical area for fishing and for wild rice. Also, this is a water-rich environment. Next slide. This is a, just a gorgeous picture. This is a picture that Nancy Schultz took on the polymet mine site itself. It is a wetlands area. It reflects what we mean when we say water-rich. And why is that important? Next slide. It's because 100%, 100% pollution, every sulfide mine that has been tried in a water-rich environment has resulted in pollution of either surface water, groundwater, or both, with acid mine drainage and toxic metals. So it's a 100% failure rate. Also, polymet itself is a promise of long-term pollution. Their own models show that they would need to treat the water at the mine site for at least 200 years. And they would need to treat the water at the tailings dump site for at least 500 years. 
and the pollution that would be seeping out of the mine pits would be forever. And so that means that you hear sometimes, oh, don't worry, this is going to have reverse osmosis. It's going to be treated. But the truth is, the facts are, the science is, there will be untreated seepage not going through the reverse osmosis. And that will happen at the mine pits, will happen at the waste rock piles, will happen at the tailings dump. And this untreated seepage is going to cause harm to drinking water, surface water. It's going to impair wild rice. And because not only leaching of mercury, but leaching of sulfate, which helps mercury bioaccumulate in the food chain, is going to increase the risk of mercury contamination of fish. So human health will ultimately also be impacted. Next. Here's a beautiful picture of the Anaconda Mine, and that's a Superfund site. What that means, it's a site where the mining company created pollution and went belly up. And who pays for Superfund sites? We all do. Taxpayers pay for them. So far, the largest source of Superfund liability in the United States, all the other industries, hard rock mining, another word for sulfide mining, is the number one source of taxpayer liability. We've paid out about $2.6 billion. This was done a couple years ago. The EPA analyzed this. Um, about $2.6 billion. But the EPA has estimated that even if we never did another <coughs> copper sulfide mine, just to clean up the ones that we already have there could cost taxpayers as much as $54 billion. And that's billion with a B if you're in the back of the calculator. So this is the kind of concern when we talk about the economics. You're trading off maybe 20 years of jobs, some of which will be coming and going, some of which will be local, with the potential for an enormous liability for people once the mining company is gone, the pollution remains. Next. This is so wonderful. Why didn't I think of doing this before? Okay. <laughs> okay, so the question is, what is Polymet and what is Glencore or Glencore Extrata? Polymet is a shell corporation. It is a shell corporation for a Canada corporation, but the primary investor in Polymet, and the reason that Polymet exists, is Glencore. And Glencore is really one of the biggest, baddest B words, um, uh, illegitimate individuals in the nation. <coughs> Actually, this foreign multinational is based in Switzerland, and it has about $200 billion in annual revenues. And it is notorious across the globe for both environmental abuses and labor abuses. And an example is the, this company has had 58 mining deaths in the period from 2008 to 2010. And that's about twice as many as the next bad actor company. But just to give you a sense, you remember Tony Hayward, the guy who after the British Petroleum huge spill, the deep water spill in the Gulf, he said he wanted to get his life back? Well, he got it back because he's the interim chairman for Glencore's Extrata. So that's who's at the helm of this company, is someone who has demonstrated their complete irresponsibility and their callousness in the face of environmental destruction. And Glencore is a highly powerful company. As a combination of its mining and its commodities, it has control of about 50% of the copper in the world. And what's interesting from the perspective of Polymet is Glencore is a strategic partner with Polymet. What that means is they've cut a deal so that at least the first five years of everything that's produced out of our Polymet mine goes to Glencore. And then when Glencore merged with this Extrata, which is a Chinese company, in 2013, they made an agreement that at least for the first eight years, all their copper goes to China. So he here's the deal. We get the home ground. We get the pollution. We get the taxpayer liability. And the money goes to Glencore goes to a foreign corporation that seems to have enough money as it is. And the copper goes to China. So that's the deal that we're looking at for Minnesota, is we get the pain, and foreign multinationals get the gain. OK, next. Here's an example. This is a document from in the supplemental draft EIS. I should tell you the reason why we're taking such a big spotlight on Parliament is not because it's the only bad thing happened. But right now, it's in a stage of a process where you can have an impact on what is happening because it is a formal legal process <coughs> called environmental review where they put on a plan, supplemental draft EIS is just a fancy word for plan, and people get a chance to comment. 
And this is before decisions are made. So this is a document from, from their own plan. And what those blue lines show is the direction through which pollution will be seeping out of all those mine features, the pits and the stockpiles. And as a matter of fact, I've had a hydrologist look at it, and he says, this isn't actually correct. Pollution would also be going up that way, which is toward the 100-mile swamp, one of the areas of great biodiversity in Minnesota. So this is actually, this pollution, all these blue pollution lines, is under-inclusive. It goes in more directions than this as well. Next slide. And so what does that mean? It means that there's going to be acid mine drainage, highly toxic, acidic water coming out of these mines. And also, as the acid comes through the rock or the um, pit wall, it carries with it metals, leaches metals that are toxic to aquatic life. And so what that means is where that water comes out, it will affect wild rice, will affect fish, and it will violate water quality standards. And a couple of the big issues, um, one of the big issues is that Pauline denies that there are fractures in rock. Now rock, Duluth complex rock is cracked. If you live around here, you know that. But they're pretending that it's almost like a little plastic bucket and nothing is ever going to get out. But we have now, I'm going to show you the next slide, think of that fractures going and faults, going right underneath where these mines and wastes are going to be. And also, there we go. See that purple little, that funny little purple shape over there? That's the mine site. There are 14, these are actually recognized faults. This is from the Minnesota Geological Survey. There's no dispute about this. This wasn't included in the polymet materials, but after the Duluth hearing, a, a geologist just volunteered. And he prepared this from us, for us from well-recognized materials. And there's also this yellow line. There's also a fault line that purples a strange little thing that looks like, I don't know, sort of flattened out state of Texas. That is the site of the tailing stone. And it looks small in that map, but it's actually 2,900 acres, or about 4.5 square miles. And there's a big fault running under that. And look at the number of faults under that mine site. And if you look right to the north of that mine site, that's the 100-mile swamp. If you look down to the south, that's where the Partridge River is. So there is a lot of vulnerability. And one other thing that they don't tell you, they talk about reverse osmosis. Everybody knows reverse osmosis, they're claiming, is going to make the water that is discharged near the tailing site nice and clean. What they don't tell you is that when you make the water nice and clean, all the really bad stuff, all that pollution goes into something called reject concentrate. You know what they're doing with the reject concentrate? They're taking it by rail car from the tailings dump to the mine site. No discussion about what happens if that spills. And then they're going to pour it onto the mine site with one liner into a pond that is only built to withstand a 100-year rain. And they don't talk about what happens if that pond maybe gets more than a 100-year rain. We've had that down here in Duluth, haven't we? Yeah. So they're going to take that and, and concentrate that bad stuff even further. And then either they're going to dump that back in that little green thing called the hydrometallurgical residue facility, or they're going to have to find someplace else, some other landfill to put it in. So the idea that they try and give in their promotions is you can have a treatment facility and it's a risk-free solution, but that's not how it works. There is bad pollution. And once you have blasted those rocks and taken something that belongs in the earth and exposed it to air and water, sulfur, when it's exposed to air and water, makes sulfuric acid. And that is really the cause of the problem. That problem doesn't go away. It gets shifted back and forth but those chemicals don't disappear. So what Water Legacy is saying, this plan does not protect water quality. And we have been asking both that the science be reexamined, the science that pretends there's no fractures, the science that pretends there's no accidents, and also that this plan has to be rejected. Next slide. Now, a couple things before we take a closer look at the plant site. Um, at the mine site, there is a permanent waste rock pile at the mine site. It, they call it Category 1, but what it is is 526 acres, 200 feet tall, about as tall as the tallest building in Duluth, and it has no liner, and it will be there forever. Now, the tailings dump, as I was saying, it's about 4.5 square miles. 
and they're going to be putting 226 million tons more of waste in it. It is also online. It is also located on top of historic streams. And what that means is for thousands of years, those streams have carried drainage in multiple directions. And yet, what they're claiming is that they're going to be able to put rows of pumps on one end of this 4.5 mile dump, and they're going to capture 99.38% of the seepage. Now, I call that the big lie because I asked the agencies, that, first of all, I want to say, as with almost every issue I'm talking about, the tribes who have been working on this issue, the Fond du Lac tribe, the Grand Portage tribe, the Boys Fort tribe, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, have been saying many of these same things now for eight years. And we're just adding more evidence and more people and more science than what they've gathered. But this is an issue they've said over and over. So one of the times they said, we don't believe you can collect all that. And what this, the agencies, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, came back and said, there are dozens of these all over the country. We can get that weight. So I asked them, they have something called a data practices request. I said, give me all the documents that show the field experience where this collections rate happens. And after fighting with, well, going back and forth and back and forth for two months, they finally said, we have no documents. There's no field experience. Now, what we do know is MINTAC has a pump back system in their tailings basin. And by their own statement, which is usually pretty optimistic, from this July, they get 50%. So needless to say, if you do all your calculations with saying, I have almost perfect collection of the pollution, you come up saying, oh, we should build it. Now, if you go back and redo them saying, well, in real life, maybe you'll only get 50%, guess what? Every single number in that document is going to change. So some of the things we're asking them, reject this junk science. Go back and do the numbers correctly based on real field experience instead of your optimistic rosy predictions. And finally, once they do the science, real science instead of fairy tale science, they're going to decide that they need to reject this project because it would cause too many risks to people and to the environment. Next. So this is, once again, this is under-inclusive. See, they're saying it's going to go all in this direction. See that little gray lake there? That's called Hecla Lake. Our geologist says there will be flow right into that lake as well. They didn't show that because Hecala Lake is impaired for mercury concentration. So they don't really want to show that. Also, there's a big, this little blue area, that's going to be where they put their new tailings. And to the south is Second Creek, which drains right into the Partridge River and is a wild rice water. And they simply ignore the fact that historically and currently, there is seepage coming to the south. So they just kind of erase the facts that they don't like. Next one. Now, for people who, this is an important technical issue, because one of the things, one of the reasons we even get environmental review is because the Army Corps of Engineers has to give a permit. What they call, they call it a Clean Water Act Section 404 permit. I call it a wetlands destruction permit. So this is what they're admitting, that there's 913 acres of wetlands that will be directly destroyed, blasting, digging, putting stuff on top of it. But they finally admitted that up to 7,351 acres could be indirectly destroyed because the mine drags out the water and then pumps it away because of air pollution, because of water pollution. So there's up to 8,264 acres of total impact. Now, according to the federal law and the state law, you're supposed to compensate for all the wetlands that you've destroyed. And this is what they do. In their plan, they don't even try to compensate for the 7,000 plus acres that could be indirectly harmed. They only say we're going to compensate for the ones that we're going to hit with a shovel. And for the ones that they're going to hit with a shovel, more than two thirds of the quote unquote compensation isn't even in the Lake Superior Basin. It's someplace else. So ecologically, it is irrelevant. Finally, as you can see from this picture and from Nancy Schultz's picture before, these wetlands are not replaceable. This is not something where you can take an area and you pour some water on it and it happens. These wetlands date from the Ice Age, pre-settlement, and they cannot be replicated. So one of the things we, we are making comments to emphasize is that the Section 404 wetlands destruction permit should be denied. Next. Okay, this is a really big deal, I think. You know, when we think about 
what's going on with honor the earth and think about the impacts on original peoples. This land that Polymet wants to take control over is a 6,000, I think it's 6,560 acres in that ballpark of land that is now Superior National Forest land. And that land, the only reason we even have this process is because that land has a special requirement that you cannot have a surface mine in a forest. So Polymet has to find some land someplace else and trade it. And then that way, they could go ahead and build their open pit mine here. But what would that mean? If you look at the plan, almost all the land they want to switch it for also has a split surface right and split mineral rights. So that we could get this new land and have mining there too. That's against the public interest. It's against the stated policy of the state. But here's one thing that I think is of particularly importance because Federal public lands can be used for hunting and gathering, and in addition to the impacts on moose and lynx, there are lots of species of plants and animals that are culturally important to tribes. If this exchange were to go through in order to make life good for Glencore, what it would mean is over 6,000 acres of high biodiversity land would be exchanged for land that does not have the same level of biodiversity. Over 2,000 acres of mature forest would be exchanged for scrub forests. It would be a, a, a complete loss, not even trying to replace 1,400 acres of floodplains. Now, they say they don't have to care about that because FEMA doesn't care. In other words, it's not near a city, but it's still a loss. And um, we uh, Michael was talking before about moose. Moose have just recently been listed by the Minnesota state government as a species of special concern because of precipitous declines, like 35% between 2012 and 2013. This polymet plan doesn't say one word about what would happen to moose with this mine and the other cumulative mines. It said, we're going to let that go now. We're not even going to put it out for public comment. Maybe at the last minute in the final document, we'll talk about it. So very important, and we've created, we've drafted a letter that really focuses in on the, uh, some of these issues about loss of public lands, loss of rights to hunt, fish, and gather in ceded territories, and impacts on species. Because this is just plain wrong. It violates the terms of treaties, <coughs> and it's against the public interest, and against, actually, the public lands law that's supposed to govern this land. Next. Finally, this is the one, I, I have to say, everyone else in my family is a doctor. So this is the one that really hits me the hardest. Um, the Palmet mine would cause some really serious implications for human health. And if you read the document, they keep saying they didn't study mercury. They don't even track how much mercury is coming out. That is one of the biggest holes, is what would happen to mercury. But as we've had scientists look at it, they say there's increased emissions of mercury, the releases of sulfate, which would uh, encourage bioaccumulation and also just the drying and wetting of the dewatering process happening in wetlands would increase mercury. Why is this important? The Minnesota Department of Health did a study just a couple of years ago, and what they found that in Minnesota's Lake Superior region, one out of ten newborns, when their blood was tested, had unsafe levels of mercury. And that was statistically higher than in either Wisconsin or in Michigan. So we have a very focused and important problem of high mercury in the blood, putting our children at risk for brain damage. And the St. Louis River in particular, the mercury in fish is higher there than in regional waters, and higher in the lower part of the St. Louis River, which is impacted by mining, than in the higher part. So it's telling us something. It's telling us something about the way we are acting. We're part of the same airshed as nearby waters. Something about the way human beings are using our waters is increasing the risk of mercury. But there's also, there are other risks from sulfide mining. I don't know if anyone has heard about this, that sulfide mining leaches out arsenic. And that increases arsenic in drinking water, like in Colby Lake, it would be going up 38.5%. And that's the drinking water for White Lakes. But also, arsenic gets trapped in the food chain. So if you eat mercury, I mean, if you eat fish, that is in a water body impacted by arsenic, there's going to be mercury in that fish. If you eat wild rice, 
in a water that is polluted with arsenic. There's going to be arsenic in that wild rice. So that people, particularly who both drink the water in the area and are hunting and fishing <coughs> and gathering, have a chance of greater susceptibility to cancer. Because arsenic is a, a class A or highest level of concern cancer-causing chemical. And there are other impacts from the, the water at the tailings dump. It has very high levels of manganese. And the health department just did a completed a study last year setting the limit of, for manganese at 100 micrograms per liter in order to prevent impacts on the brain of infants and children. Now, some of the discharge from the polymet tailings basin is going to be as much as 15 times higher. So the risks to the brain development of children. And interestingly, this plan, PolyMed's plan, did not even try and predict what would be the impacts on people who have residential wells near the tailings basin. They know that there are 39 wells between the tailings dump and the Barris River, and they did nothing to try and predict what the impacts would be. Also, they didn't predict what would happen to the workers. They measured and found at the property edge the levels of pollutants, primarily nickel and diesel, are high enough so that they're just at the boundary of where it's unsafe under Minnesota law. And they didn't even do an analysis what would be done, what would be the increased risk of cancer or non-cancer illness for people who work at the mine and the plant. So one of the things we've been asking is that in this process, before the polymet mine goes forward, they need to do a health assessment. They need to look at mercury. They need to look at brain damage. They need to look at residential wells. And they need to pay attention to what's going to happen to workers. And also, I guess the bottom line is, one of the reasons not to accept this project is human health. I mean, there are environmental reasons, but there are also the fundamental reasons that this is not going to be safe for the next generation of our kids. Next slide. OK. And then we're getting towards the end here. Climate change, it's all connected. I don't think this picture on the left that's the tailings dump site. And this picture on the right is recycled copper. What many people don't realize is how much of an impact on climate change, change the mining process is. Over a 20-year mine plan, the polymet project would emit over 15 million CO2 equivalent tons of pollution, about 10 million of which would be from burning coal. And if you look at just one year, of the CO2 equivalent emissions from the polymet mine, and you compare it to all the CO2 equivalent emissions from Duluth, this one mine is equivalent to one fourth of the emissions of Duluth. Transportation, heating, cars, everything. So this is a huge impact on climate change happening right here. And what they found is recycling saves about 90% of that energy. And even though you have to melt down the copper scrap in order to refine to finish it, it saves about 90% of energy. And as a result of the high commodities pricing, which is what's pushing this stupid mine, uh, a lot more recycling is now taking place. So about 50% of US copper is now from scrap. And they've done a sort of a tentative analysis just based on how much copper is there already in circulation. And based on that supply, we would have the potential for as much as triple how much recycling we're doing. So it's, it, if people tell you, you have a choice between this awful thing on the left and no cell phone, tell them you can have both. We simply need to use what we've already dug and blasted out of the ground. Smart. Um, a teenager was giving a speech about a month ago um, in, about environmental law. He says, we need to stop acting like we have another planet to go to when we're done with this one. Yeah. Kids. Kids, great. Next slide. So the question is, can the polymet mine be stopped? And that grade in the corner is what the Environmental Protection Agency gave the first version of polymet's plan. They gave it a very unusual two failing grades. One for the plan, the quality of the science itself. They said the plan was unsatisfactory, and it was inadequate. And then they also said that it was environmentally unsatisfactory, primarily due to the risk of water. And right now is a time when we have, I hope, the opportunity to put just a little bit more sand in the gears, because this plan is still inadequate, and the project is still environmentally unsatisfactory, 
and we need to be part of the process of communicating that. We have until March 13th, 2014. Next slide. Now, before you leave here today, where's Alan? Where's Alan? And where's Alyssa? Why, now, I'm not trying to say that you have to use our form letters. Please, God bless, take the little cards that look like this. They have a, an, a, a URL address where you can fill in and send whatever you want. There's no rule that says you have to use a form letter. But at the very least, we have prepared some letters, one which focuses on the water pollution and one which focuses on the injustice and incredible stupidity of the land exchange and taking away our national forests and our ceded territories for the private interests of this group. So Alan and Alyssa are going to stand. Do you want to pass them out or do you want to stand by the door? We could do both. All right, do both. Just pass them down the aisle, and then before you leave, um, sign them and, and give them to either Alan or Alyssa. But also feel free to write your own comments or to use those as a template and add to them. But I think it's really important. At least get your voice heard. At least in this environment, both quantity and quality matter. It is important for them to know that a lot of people care. And if you have the time and the passion to do your own research, that's also important. But both quantity and quality matter. And in each of your comments, as you're writing them on your own, you can see from our model, we focus on a few specific issues, and we end with an ask. So it's not just, I'm worried about mercury. It's, I'm worried about mercury, redo the EIS, reject the project. And not just, we think the land exchange is not a good idea. It's, reject the land exchange. Use your fiduciary responsibility to protect treaty rights. So this is kind of an idea of how to um, communicate. But a lot of people say, well, why does it matter? Even if this ends up in court, a judge does not count literally and read all these comments. But judges are people, too. If a judge has before him 8,000 comments and they are all for the mind, it is very different than if he has before him 15,000 comments and two-thirds or three-quarters of them say, this is a bad risk. Judges are people, too, and so is the governor. And in addition to sending your comments, if you have some time to write something for your local paper, even if it's the you know, Highland Villager, the Times newspaper, um, if you have time to call the governor or call your legislators, the more, the more, this is a place where your personal calls matter. Call Al Franken. You, don't, you won't talk to him. But when you take the trouble to make a phone call, it will be logged. And the fact that it's a regular citizen rather than some paid lobbyist will matter. So even if you don't say, I'm not the biggest expert, you don't have to be the biggest expert. You have to be a person who's committed to protecting something and a person who's committed to repairing the world. Next. So, whose water is it anyway? <coughs> I guess starting with what Michael said, the water belongs to all of us. It belongs to whatever powers were here before us and will be here long after us. The water does not belong to Polymet. It does not belong to Glencore. It does not belong to any short-term economic scheme that is going to leave hundreds of years of pollution for us to clean up and will put our children's health at risk. So if you believe this water is yours, mine, ours, please take action. Please sign a letter. And please do the extra thing of talking to your friends, making a phone call, putting something in writing for your local newspaper. Put it up on your Facebook. There's a lot of information at waterlegacy.org about this polymet mine. And the more you share, the more you can be part of building the movement, as well as someone who is now, hopefully, really educated. Thank you very much.